Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our business rates and lease advisory autumn update. My name is Jordan Kennedy, and I'm the head of business rates consultancy at Vickery Holman. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Amy Durkin, who is the head of lease advisory. Amy and I are both chartered senior surveyors. Amy has been with Vickery Holman for just over four years, and I've been with the company for just over three years. Between us and our teams, we cover Truro, Plymouth, Exeter and Bristol and the many areas in between. Um, you should see some polls appearing um, in the chat box during our presentation, one of which has popped up already. Um, so please do take a look at those and fill in your answers. And of course, you can also use the chat box to post any questions, which we will address at the end. So before we start, uh, we would just like to take a moment to remind you of the other services Vickery Holman offer, in addition to business rates consultancy and lease advisory. So as you can see here, we have building surveying, agency, property management, valuation and development services departments, and we offer dispute resolution services across these specialisms. So what do we have in store for you today? I'm going to start with an update about the 2023 business rates revaluation as the draft rating list was published a little under two weeks ago, um, which coincided with the autumn statement. So I'm going to first of all go through the headline outcomes of the publication of the draft rating list and the headline announcements in the autumn statement. Amy is then going to take you through three case studies, each focusing on a different aspect of lease advisory. So we will start with a rent review at a restaurant, followed by a lease renewal at an industrial unit and a lease surrender at an office premises. Alongside this, I'm going to let you know how each of our example properties that we are using in our case studies will be affected by the business rates revaluation, how their rateable values are calculated and how you might look to appeal the rateable value of the different property types should you suspect they are too high or should the property's circumstances change. So as you may well already be aware, the Valuation Office Agency, or VOA, estimate the open market rental value of a property on what is known as an antecedent valuation date, or AVD. This, is, this estimate of the open market rental value of the property becomes known as the property's rateable value. This figure is then multiplied at a rate which is determined by the government to produce an annual business rates liability. Rateable values are updated periodically to bring business rates liabilities in line with market conditions. And this is essentially what a business rates revaluation is. And we are currently approaching the first revaluation in six years, which means that as of the 1st of April 2023, all businesses will have a new rateable value. On the 17th of November, the draft rating list was published. This means that businesses can now view their draft rateable value for 2023 on the government's find and check your business rates valuation website. Um, also on the 17th of November, it was announced in the autumn statement that the business rates multipliers would be frozen for a further year. So this means you're now able to calculate your 2023 to 2024 business rates liability. So the headline outcomes of the publication of the draft rating list were much as we expected and the graph you'll see here shows uh, the percentage changes that are going to be taking place nationally. So Vickery Holman had predicted that the retail sector would benefit from the revaluation, whilst the industrial sector would bear the brunt of the increase in rateable values. Um, as you can see, these predictions have been proven correct, with retail rateable values reducing by 10% and industrial rateable values increasing by 27.1% nationally. Rateable values within the office sector have increased by 10.2%, whilst rateable values which fall outside these three main categories have increased by 4.2% overall. And this totals on an all sector basis an increase in 7.1%. Moving on to the Southwest more specifically, the total number of rateable properties has remained the same, but the total rateable value pool has increased from approximately 1.7 million to approximately 1.87 million. So this equates to a 9.5% increase in rateable values across all sectors in the southwest of England. As you can see, retail rateable values have gone up by 4.7% across the region. 
and industrial rateable values have increased by 27%. Um, we have seen the total rateable value within the office sector increase by 14% and rateable values outside the three main categories have increased by 5.9% overall. So as you can see, rateable values in the retail sector have actually fallen less in the southwest than they have na nationally, whilst increases in the office and other sectors, including leisure and hospitality, have been higher than the national average. So as you can see, from the 1st of April of next year, many businesses will be facing new business rates bills following these new valuations of their properties to reflect more recent market conditions. So in light of this, uh, in the autumn budget, the government announced that it will take a number of steps to help ratepayers, which should result in the total increase in business rates bills being less than 1% nationally next year. As you can see on this slide, um, the measures include the business rates multiplier being frozen for another year, which should go some way to protect businesses from rising inflation. The existing retail, hospitality and leisure relief scheme will be increased from 50% to 75% relief for the entirety of 2023 to 2024. Transitional relief will be reformed. So all businesses that do benefit from a lower rateable value as a result of the revaluation will benefit from the decrease in their bills straight away, whilst those who receive higher bills will have their increases capped on a year by year basis. And finally, small businesses who lose their eligibility for small business or rural rate relief due to new property valuations will be supported through a more generous supporting small business scheme worth over 500 million pounds. I'll now pass you over to Amy to discuss the first of our case studies. Thanks Jordan, there's a lot of very interesting things happening in the last couple of weeks there. So we'll move on to our first case study here, which is a typical Exeter High Street restaurant premises, a rent of £40,000. Uh, in this situation, there is a rent review due in about a month's time. Um, and the lease is really key here to work out how it should be done, what the next steps will be. The first thing to establish is what kind of rent review it will be. And there's usually two options. There's a market rent, open market rent rent review, or an index linked one. Um, the latter is usually linked to an RPI or a CPI index figure. Um, and you take the figure from the lease start date and the rent review date and apply this to the current rent. So you get an uplift. Until recently, an index linked review would tend to produce a lower increase than um, a market rent in many cases and sectors. However, these figures have really flown in the last year um, due to inflation. So this actually is probably going to uh, be less advantageous for tenants than it used to be. If we look at the market rent review, uh, there's a de definition of market rent there. Um, upward only in most cases, so the rent will either stay the same or go up, um, though more tenants are arguing for a upward or downward review, which is arguably more fair, although it does put um, landlords in a trickier position with less guarantee. Uh, there are a number of assumptions and disregards in a rent review. Again, most leases will set these out quite substantially um, in the clauses. Um, a typical assumption, assumption is that the property is vacant and suitable for immediate occupation. The hypothetical term is the one that we are looking for evidence to compare against. And that is usually um, either 10 years duration or what's called the unexpired residue, um, whichever is longer. Uh, the, some of the typical disregards are for improvements that the tenant has made, which can be quite contentious in situation of mezzanine floors where no one's quite sure who did the mezzanine. Um, and also with rent free periods, which uh, some of these would be for a fit out uh, for that start of a lease, which would be considered to be disregarded. However, if a tenant was to get a big um, rent free period as an incentive, then this would be um, thought of and used in uh, analysis of rent as it has the effect of basically reducing the average rent over the term. Finally, on, on a point on the rent review, what if no agreement can be sought? There is a process to follow third party determination. 
Uh, and again, in the lease, it will set out um, who is to be found as the expert. So you've either got independent expert or arbitrator. Um, and in both of these cases, they will take the case on, um, use evidence from the other parties or from their own knowledge and experience and make a determination or award. Um, the costs, there are extra costs to this process and therefore in the majority of cases an agreement can usually be found through negotiation. Um, but if there is a large gap between figures or valuation approaches, then this is a way forward. The process can take usually a few months, can be longer depending on how quick the parties respond. And if one party is more hesitant than the other, then that can cause quite big delays. Back to Jordan. Thanks, Amy. Um, so yes, using our example of a restaurant, um, I'm now just going to talk about this in terms of its rateable value and uh, business rates liability. So the data about the 2023 revaluation suggests that although retail units are due to be going down overall, um, the rateable values of restaurants in Exeter itself are looking to increase by approximately 3.6% from April. Um, occupied restaurants will benefit from the 75% retail, hospitality and leisure relief in 2023 to 2024, but we don't know yet what will happen beyond that, so they may, may well return to paying their full liability in the second two years of the three-year rating list. So it is therefore definitely worth ensuring the rateable value is accurate. So most high street restaurants are valued on a price per square metre basis. And restaurants of this nature are measured in terms of zone A, which is a method of applying a unit of rent to the zones of the area of the restaurant for rental valuation purposes. This principle uh, follows that the most valuable area is to be found at the front, so the display area, often near a glazed frontage, and that that value then declines with the increasing depth of the unit, so the increasing distance from the front. The restaurant is then divided into zones, usually of equal depth, with the value of the first zone being, for example, £300 per square metre. Each zone is then halved back in value. So zone B would be £150 per square metre in this example, zone C, 75 and so on. And the rate per square metre itself is based upon local rental evidence at the antecedent valuation date. So a key way of checking the accuracy of the rateable value of a restaurant is therefore to have a professional measure the premises in full to ensure the floor area the valuation office are using to calculate the rateable value is correct. And it can therefore, of course, be particularly important to check that zone A has been measured correctly as this is the most valuable area. Having confirmed the floor areas, uh, we would then carry out comparable evidence research to ensure the rate per square meter used in the valuation appears to be fair. And if any inaccuracies are found, a check or challenge can be submitted on the occupier's behalf but via the government gateway. Uh, the rateable value of restaurants in unique or rural locations or pubs is calculated slightly differently. It is done on a re receipts and expenditure method basis. In this, the fair maintainable trade of the premises at the AVD, so the antecedent valuation date, is established based on the actual turnover figures and a percentage is applied to this to reflect the quality and location to produce a rateable value. And again, this is something that is most definitely worth having a professional look into on your behalf. I'm gonna pass you back to Amy now for the second of our case studies. Brilliant, okay, so yeah, second case study, we're moving on to the industrial sector now. Um, typical Bodmin premises and a rent of £35,000. In this scenario, we have a lease renewal and it's due in about six months' time. Um, the landlord and tenant both want a new lease in this situation. Um, so, first of all, a review of the market rent and suitable lease terms would be done. Um, with the comparable evidence, what we're looking for is 
the most modern transactions because this lease expiry date is in the future we really don't want to go too far back um, because we still have to you know allow for the difference in um, rent between now and may potentially um, we'd be looking at the units of very similar size and condition ideally um, and with industrial estates if you have units on the same estate or the same road they make the ultimate comparables really um, with the service of the section 25 and section 26 notices so for those who don't know uh, section 25 is a notice from landlord to tenant and a section 26 is a notice from tenant to landlord and each gives a time period between 12 and six months uh, noting that the tenancy will end at this point and suggests new lease terms to be negotiated agreed adopted um, going forward to put the new lease together. Um, the minimum time period for these notices is six months notice. So if we were to serve one today for this lease expiry, then um, the lease would come to an end on the actual expiry date. Um, and that gives six months um, time to negotiate with the other side, look at comparable evidence, etc. cetera. Um, if we were to wait, or perhaps we weren't instructed till a later date, uh, then, the, the notice served one month later, say, the tenant would effectively have uh, one more month at um, potentially a lower rent than it is at market level, particularly with industrial properties, we're expecting rents to generally increase. So the longer period there is between serving the notice um, and uh, the, the lease expiry, then potentially the longer you're going to have a tenant holding over at a lower rent. Now there is a way to recruit this uh, difference in rent called interim rent and it's dealt with um, through the court process so it is possible to um, try and um, uh, change the, the situation regarding to lower rent um, however the best thing simplest thing to do is to just be proactive with the lease renewal uh, instruct a surveyor um, between 12 and six months time and they will analyze the rent and suggest market terms to negotiate uh, and then if necessary the section 25 or 26 can be served um, with adequate time for negotiations to go through thanks amy um, so as amy mentioned the rateable value on this premises is actually currently a little bit lower than the rent and this is because current rateable values are based on rents in April 2015. However, as I said slightly earlier, as the upcoming revaluation looks to bring rateable values in line with current market conditions, rateable values are going to become more in line with the rising industrial rental market. So data suggests rateable values of industrial properties in the southwest will be increasing overall by 27% next year. And taking a look at Bob Min more specifically, this increase is set to amount to approximately 16%. Uh, so again, definitely something that may be worth checking um, to ensure that you're only paying the fair amount when these new rateable values do kick in in April of next year. Industrial premises are valued on a price cost price per square meter basis as well. The VOA assess the rental value of the property, assuming a hypothetical tenancy, which is based on the following seven assumptions. It is assumed that the property is vacant and that it, it is available to let on an annual tenancy. It is assumed that it will be let on full repairing and insuring terms. It's assumed it is in good repair, that the tenant is paying the rates and that it will be in its current use and finally, that no or only very minor alterations have been made. I think the assumption of good repair is particularly important to note, as a unit being in disrepair or poor repair does not automatically translate into a lower rateable value. Um, industrial properties, and in fact all properties on the rating list, are also placed within a valuation scheme by the valuation office. And this valuation scheme reflects the location, quality, age and other factors of that property. So again, a key way of checking the accuracy of the rateable value of industrial premises 
is to have a professional measure the premises in full and again to ensure that the floor area is correct. Um, and then having confirmed the floor areas, we would again carry out comparable evidence research to ensure the rate per square meter used in the valuation looks fair. And we would also look at the different rates that are applied to different areas within the units. Um, so office areas, stores, production floors, um, workshop areas, and mezzanines all often have different rates applied to them. So it is worth checking that the rates applied throughout the property appear reasonable and not simply the overall rate. And finally, we would also check that the property has been placed in the correct or an appropriate valuation scheme and that it looks fair within properties in the near vicinity within that valuation scheme as well. And finally, on industrial premises, planter machinery can also attract a rateable value. And so it can also be important to ensure that only the plant and machinery that are located at the premises are included in the valuation of the property. Great, thank you, Jordan. Uh, looking at our final case study, then moving on to the office sector. Um, uh, this is no office in particular, just a typical large Bristol office a sizable rent at £120,000 per annum. In this situation, the uh, break option has passed for a tenant and there are another two years till the lease expiry. So the tenant is considering a surrender of their current lease because uh, they wish to just downsize as quick as possible. Uh, so a lease surrender is essentially a negotiation between landlord and tenant as to what level of premium uh, if any, should be paid to the landlord for the tenant's early exit. This needs to be a balance between the uh, loss of income for the landlord from the property resulting from the tenant leaving, so the annual rent, um, and also the bills that they will have to pay, such as business rates, although Jordan will come on to that in a second, uh, utilities and building insurance. And this will be weighed up with market considerations, how popular is the area, how lettable is the unit, what kind of void period would we be looking at. Um, in some cases recently I've seen where um, there has been no premium paid because the landlord has been very confident that they can relet the property in a matter of weeks or months. It tends to be um, little industrial units. Um, Another situation is where the landlord actually is looking at maybe redeveloping property in the future and would normally have to wait for the, the tenant to leave or use the section 25 to ask them to leave, um, where in, in this case they would be able to get their property back perhaps a couple of years early and therefore they would be happy to let the tenant go without paying any extra premium. Um, but with this sort of property, with the Bristol office, the market is reasonably buoyant, but for the level of rent and other bills that the uh, landlord would be having, I would expect some sort of premium to be paid by this tenant for an early exit. Thank you, Amy. Um, yes, finally, um, office rateable values are set, as I said, to increase overall um, by approximately 14% in the southwest in April of 2023. And in Bristol, more specifically, where our example is located, the increase amounts to approximately 20%. So office rateable values are calculated in much the same way as industrial properties. So on a price per square meter basis, which is again informed by a range of values within an appropriate valuation scheme. Um, but in this case, as Amy mentioned, the property will be due to become vacant at some point, um, and if not relet straight away, this would see the business rates liability return to the landlord. Uh, so in this case, we would advise the landlord, first of all, to have a professional review of the business rates assessment carried out, as I have already discussed. Um, but another consideration here is that when a property becomes empty, empty property relief applies for three months for offices and that's actually currently six months for industrial units and after which time uh, full rates then become payable once again by the landlord occupier 
So if, as in this example, the landlord finds themselves with the empty unit, after the three month exemption period, they would become liable to pay the business rates again in full. Um, we do work with various landlords offering a solution to this, which can be implemented indefinitely until such time as the property is reoccupied. And this allows the liable occupier to enjoy additional periods of empty property rates relief. Alternatively, um, finding themselves with a vacant property, the landlord may also decide to redevelop. Um, this could come in the form of a change of use. So perhaps converting the office to a residential property or just in fact, reconfiguring the office to make it more appealing to future occupiers. So subdividing the property into smaller units, for example. Where a property is undergoing significant redevelopment or refurbishment, it could be possible to have it temporarily removed from the rating list whilst the works are ongoing. Um, so in this case, we would be able to advise the landlord if the planned works would constitute the type of works required to remove the property from the rating list. And if it would amount to this kind of work, we could submit a detailed check with supporting evidence on the client's behalf and negotiate with the valuation office to achieve the best possible savings during the period in question. And finally, if the property were to be subdivided into smaller units and relet in individual units, we can assist with liaising with the valuation office to split the property into the new hereditaments and liaise with the local authority as well on the client's behalf to ensure each ratepayer was receiving the appropriate bills. So that's all from me. Um, I think the key point I have hopefully conveyed is that rateable values can and should be checked for accuracy. Um, there is still time to check the accuracy of your current rateable value um, up until the 31st of March of next year. And I think this is actually a really excellent time to do so as changes to the current list can be backdated to the 1st of April, 2017. And we are now able to submit checks to in relation to factual errors in summary evaluations in relation to the upcoming 2023 rating list. Um, so this will feed into the new rating list to ensure that the new rateable value is based upon the correct information. Um, and please remember, we offer a free 15 minute, no obligation consultation about anything business rates related. And our team are always happy to have an initial discussion to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, great. On that point, um, if there are any questions, um, please put them in the chat box and um, there's a one or two there. I'll just have a look at the polls as well that have been running whilst we've been speaking. Um, some interesting answers. So have you ever checked your business rates? Uh, we had 50% was yes, but some time ago, which is interesting. Yeah. As we said, there's a lot of changes that have happened recently, so it may well be worth having another look. Yeah. Uh, recently, well done, very proactive. <laughs> um, and 36 notes on my to-do list, great. If you'd like some help, do get Happy in touch. Have a talk, yeah. Um, and the second poll, are you aware of the new draft rating list? 58% uh, yes, but haven't looked. Great, it has only been out a few weeks, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, I've taken a look, great. And no, what is it? I imagine Jordan has answered that question now. Going Hopefully. Through <laughs> but if not, very happy to discuss. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, in the chat, the question Leslie has put forward first, uh, how early can I start negotiating a rent review is an optimum time period? Uh, yes, you can't really start before six months. Um, before the rent review. And if you're going to appoint a third party, you also can't appoint them before six months. So we would normally say we could maybe start looking at the evidence slightly before six months, but you can't start serving trigger notices or negotiating um, before that period. Um, and that's partly to do with the comparable evidence as well. Again, you don't, a lot can happen in six months. And although you'd like to ideally have the uh, negotiation done on the event, uh, the rent review day. Um, it's not essential. And there is, um, you know, most when you agree a, a rent, most of the time you can backdate it to the rent review date. 
so it's not a problem to to trigger a rent review that's actually already passed as well um, so it's quite flexible there for triggering a rent review um, then there are a couple of things here Jordan can you see the yeah, chat yeah I can um, so Dina or Dinah first of all um, the question about whether or not it's possible to have a, a one-page document which could be sent out to tenants to advise them what they should do regarding rates um, yes I certainly certainly do think that's something that would be possible to do and I think I will um, I'll grab your email address off of our attendee list and email you on that separately afterwards the um, out as well. yeah know that yes um, we do have two fact sheets attached to this presentation as well um, Oh, thank you. You just said you've seen the summary. <laughs> so yeah, please feel free to use that. Um, Joe asks if I can repeat what I said about plant and machinery. Um, yes. So in of industrial premises um, may on the summary valuation have a separate section detailing the rateable value applied to plant and machinery on the premises. Um, so it's worth checking this is correct by contacting the valuation office to ask what is included in that breakdown so it's not shown publicly on the summary valuation but if requested they do need to let you know what's included so yeah that's something we can talk through with you and definitely something worth checking because the the amounts on those can be quite high at times um and andy uh, thank you for your question so this yes the saving is still capped at 110 pounds for those who benefit from the the retail leisure and hospitality relief and that's 110 per business so per business group not per rateable property if your business occupies more than one property whose reliefs would total more than 110,000 pounds um and andy again no so what constitutes removing a shop from a rating list if it was in a shell condition without a toilet that would most likely be viewed as an attempt to avoid paying business rates by putting it into disrepair rather than it being disrepair itself um so the valuation office i suppose as i said there one of their assumptions is that the property is in good repair um so they would assume that it would be economically possible to replace the toilet and to fit out that property to, to put it in a state where it could be let so long answer for no yeah <laughs> there um there are very few ways of actually removing a, a property from the rating list isn't in yeah. there and the main one is redevelopment yeah or refurbishment works being done that are uh make the property so a not occupiable that you can't be in there mm -hmm. um, but pretty much everything else as you said they regard as being in repair even if it isn't <laughs> yeah it's quite well, yes, it's very hard to prove that it would be uneconomical to repair a property, I think. Yes, and then the question from Nick there, uh, that's still a rating question. Um, yes, significant rent reductions on retail properties. Uh, I mean, the, the rateable value has been calculated from April 2021, rents mm -hmm. at that time. So, and from what you've shown on the graphs, there is generally a decent reduction in yeah the i have on some re retail properties seen reductions of up to 50 percent, which will have reflected the values at the april avd um yeah. so yeah, as in theory these should have been fed into the rv calculations when the request for information was sent out by the valuation office for um rent and lease details during this year um those those details do feed into the rateable values that are now issued and also it's a reduction from the April 2020, uh, 2015 mm. um, levels. So it may not seem like a giant reduction because it's actually coming from quite a long time ago, okay. not, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, the answer there would be it ought to have been um, considered in the rental value. But if you thought that what wasn't the case and you had evidence to prove that you had April 2021 evidence that showed a much lower level, then that's perfect yeah. to go through the challenge process. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Okay. I Thank you for those questions. questions. Yeah, very good questions. Um, so yeah, we will wrap up now. Obviously, any more questions, please let us know. Uh, and there are handouts available on here. So we've got the the rating revaluation handout which is brand new 
and also the lease advisory handout which has the contacts for each office um, and a bit more information there um, so if that's all uh, thank you thank you very much for your time and uh, yeah we hope to see you again on other webinars this webinar will also be on youtube shortly uh, to catch up with or show your colleagues um, so yeah thank you very much Bye -bye. thank you